Have you ever wondered how small steps led the people of Israel out across the sea and away from the Egyptian army? That's what we'll talk about today. But in this time, through his teaching and by his example, Jesus Christ would show the world how small steps taken in faith and in hope can overcome long-held differences and deep-seated divisions to bring us harmony and understanding. Queen Elizabeth II, 2018 Christmas Speech If you don't know the story of my other podcast, Start With Small Steps, that speech is what set me up for that podcast because it meant so much to me about how she talked about small steps, and even in the steps of Jesus, were small steps. She goes on to say after that, Many of us try to follow in his footsteps. The path, of course, is not always smooth. And may at times this year have felt quite bumpy. But small steps can make a world of difference. Today we're going to continue our discussion, The Red Sea Rules, 10 God-Given Strategies for Difficult Times, by Robert J. Morgan. Last time we talked about the first two rules and how God will save us just like he saved his people in Exodus 14. And this book helps clarify why bad things happen and what to do once they do happen. It's a mind frame set. It's about action. The last time, more was about our mind frame set. This time, we're going to talk a little bit more about the action things that we can do in order to get through the situation that we're in. He says that rule number three, Acknowledge the enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. So think about the people, right? So God opens up the sea and they're crossing behind it. They're being chased. If you spent all your time looking backwards, eyeballing the people who are chasing you, or if we're coming through a trial in our life and the devil is after us, (laughs) something is going wrong with someone else, something is going wrong on a spiritual sense, If we focus on the bad person, we focus on the devil, we're not going to find our way out of it. Imagine if you were riding a bike and a giant bear was chasing you in the woods, right? And if you just kept turning around and looking at him, you would get eaten by the bear. You have to face forward. And we have to face God and not keep turning around and looking at the enemy. He says, quote, Have you ever felt pursued, oppressed, sensed the devil nipping at your heel? See, we're being chased at all the times. And it may not seem, in this particular case, it was an army that was chasing them. But who set the army on to the people of Israel? The Pharaoh was willing to let them go. And who was whispering in Pharaoh's ear, you're just going to let them go? They're yours. How are you going to get all this work done? Look at all the stuff they left behind that was their job to do. So Pharaoh's mind got tempted by the devil. And so even it Though it seems like a physical threat, there is a spiritual threat in that same story. And same thing with us, that when we go through a trial, it may not feel like a spiritual battle, but there's certainly a spiritual battle in there. Because maybe we're struggling with our finances, or we lost our jobs and we're so stressed out. What is that voice in our head telling us that we're failing, telling us that we can't get there, and telling us that we can't meet our obligations? That's the devil right there. Even so, when you're talking about real-life harms, sometimes the spiritual battle feels very far away. I'm not personally very worried about Satan because I know God defeats Satan in the end. But what about the bills? And what about my health? And what about my friends and family? And are we all going to get through this together? Is this going to work out okay? Are my friends' business, is it going to be okay? And that seems, in a lot of ways, more real. That Pharaoh can look bigger, more dangerous than Satan can look. And so it still causes us pain and worrying and wondering what's going to happen next. So if we just acknowledge that something bad is happening to us, but we focus our eyes on God and can see that God is going to provide a way out, we will be able to escape some of that emotional stress that's going through us because we know how this ends. 
And even Paul, he mentions in the book, talked all the time that there was organizational struggles and people bickering and situations that were happening in Paul's life that seems like structural problems, him getting arrested or having travel woes. But Paul recognized this as a war with Satan. He knew that this was Satan trying to come out against him. And he says, our fight is not against the physical enemy. It's against organizations and powers that are spiritual. I'm not sure what translation that is, but, you know, some people will say um, principalities, you know, evil is about there. Even though to us, it looks like a physical struggle or a logistical struggle. I think about the biking, too. When you're biking, and if you've ever gone on a bike, and there's a big rut in the middle of the road, if you keep staring at that rut, oh my gosh, I hope I don't go in that rut. That's going to throw me off my bike. Oh no, here comes the rut. Here comes the rut. And if you're staring at the rut, 99 out of 100 times, you're going to go into that rut because you're staring at it. Where you want to stare, and what they teach you to stare when you're bike riding, is look at the place you want to go. It is a weird psychological thing but you go what you're staring at. And I think too, that's why people don't get through their temptations that they have in their life. Let's say that you have someone who is addicted to gambling. Oh, I hope I don't gamble. I don't want to gamble. Maybe I better not gamble. And then they just think about gambling all the time and it causes them to get attracted to gambling again because it's all they can think about how they don't want to go back there. And so what they need to focus is on what they want not what they're trying to get away from. If I thought about donuts all the time, I'm going to think about donuts all the time. But instead, I should focus my thoughts, focus my eyes on my healthy living. Same thing here. We have to keep our eyes focused on God because if we focus on the devil, we keep staring at the devil chasing behind us, it's what we're going to do. He's going to get us. We're going to fall into whatever trap it is he's trying to set for us. Step four he says, is pray. And he gives the quote in Exodus 4.10, where all of a sudden the people started to cry out to God. They were so scared. And we think of prayer sometimes as the Lord's Prayer, or there's prayers in the Bible. But what we forget is there's Hannah, who was weeping. Sometimes our prayers are cries. Sometimes our prayers are sobbing. Sometimes our prayers are just sitting there going, uh, um, uh, oh no. You know, it's not words. It's not formalized. So when you have to pray, don't try to put on yourself that you have to structure it in such a way that sounds majestic and fully flushed out and using proper grammar. You want to pray what's coming from your heart. And if it's fear and if it's worry, it could just be crying. He said, quote, their cry at the seaside was, quote, urgent, united, unfeigned, but unbelieving. I think they thought they were doomed. They didn't trust in the Lord at that moment, but God saved them anyway. He says the rule number five, stay calm, confident, and give God time to work. Sometimes answers don't happen like that. Sometimes answers don't happen on a dime. In this particular case with Exodus, they were there, they saw the Egyptians rushing towards them, and the sea opened up. But sometimes it's not quite like that. When Israel cried out for a Savior, how long did it take before Jesus came? So you have to give God that time to get that thing done. So that means that there might be waiting, that might cause stress, but we have to trust in God. We have to let him do his thing. We have to give him room. Someone said that you have to give room so that God can have his wrath. But also, doesn't that mean that we have to give God room for his love and his understanding and his forgiveness and his grace and his saving? I mean, remind me of this old story about a little girl who had a doll and her parent wanted to fix the doll for her, but she was gripping it so tight that she wouldn't let the parent take it. And that sometimes... That's how we bring about our own fears. We're gripping whatever it is that is making us so worried so tightly that we won't give it up to God so that we could let him do his work. So just don't fear and let God do his thing. And he says, 
Psalm 37, 7 through 8, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret. It only causes harm. But think about that. Fretting is only going to do us more harm. So if we think we're in a harmful situation now, just you wait. If We keep fretting about it. And we talked about that in podcast episode four about being fearless. God tells us not to be afraid. So I won't talk about it much here, but just trust in God. Work on getting that fear out of you. Rule number six, when you're unsure, just take the next right step. We have to go in a direction. Imagine if the former slaves just stood there in a panic. Instead, they had to take the next step, which was into the sea. If they had waited, if they had not set out, just like the Egyptian army. Someone was talking about how they knew what God meant for them to do in their life, and it meant going overseas and speaking the word of God to people, and he just couldn't bring himself to buy the plane ticket to go. That was the next step, was to get the plane ticket. And he said, well, I don't have the money to buy the plane ticket, so obviously I can't. Then the money came to him. Well, I can't do that. He wouldn't take that next step. But this is a podcast, Small Steps with God, because we talk about taking that next small step. We have to keep walking every day, every small step. A couple of years ago, I did a 100-mile hike in England, and someone asked me, how do you get through a 100-mile hike in England? And you know, it's funny because at first it's pretty tough, and then your body starts to get used to it. But I'll tell you, the only way that you get through any hike, small or large, is just taking one step at a time. And that's the same thing that we have to do in all these trials we have in our life is do the next right thing one small step at a time. We have to live in that moment. We have to live in that day. I had a friend once say, I only live one day at a time because I can only screw up that much. It's kind of an interesting philosophy, but it's true that we just have to do the next thing. And God will be there with us every step of the way. I mean, And he brings up the point that what if you were there while the water was being held back on either side? You know, were there fish flying like the children's Bible showed, like fish looking at all the people of Israel? But you had to take that first step into the water, not knowing if it was going to crash in on you at any moment. But your only other choice was to stay there with the Egyptians. Take the next best step. He says that you have to envision God's presence in your life. And while you're taking that step, Just imagine, envision what God is doing with you. Rule number seven, feel the presence of God in whatever trial you're having. And here he gives four solutions for you so that you can feel God's presence. The escaping slaves in Exodus 14 had God's presence through a pillar of fire and smoke. They saw God with them. The angel of God went before the camp of Israel and then went behind the camp of Israel. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israelis. And so they had God near them. But when we're with God and we're going through this struggle, the first thing is James 4, 8, draw near to God and get closer to God and get that nearness to him so that you can feel his presence when you're going through this tough time. He says, second, you should visualize God in your mind. And he mentions that people who see him as a friend, see him sitting next to them, his his daughter who would imagine God at her bed. I heard a long time ago that Martin Luther would go for walks and he would imagine instead of formally praying to God that God was walking by his side and he would just talk to God as if God was a friend of his. He was visualizing God in that relationship. And I heard about that very early on when I became a Christian, and that stuck with me. So now when I pray to God, that's how I do it too. I go for walks in the woods, or if I'm just at home, I pretend that God's right there with me, and I'm just talking to him. (laughs) Because in the end, he was a human being, and he understands where we're at. The third step is to pray to God. When we get an awareness and a closeness to God, it's through a prayer. And then the fourth is realize that if God is always with us, he is always present with us, it says that it changes our demeanor, meaning how we stand, that every place we're at, 
becomes holy ground because God is standing next to us. And by changing the demeanor, does it make you sit up a little bit straighter? Does it change your boldness? If you were being threatened in some sort of way, and then you looked over and you saw God standing next to you, would your presence change? Would the way that you act change? It would. So as we get closer to God and we sense and visualize his presence with us, it's going to change the way we stand in the face of our trials. He says even when we're doing volunteer work and it's something hot and it's not really enjoyable, God is standing there right next to us too. And so it also should change the way that we think about what we're doing and how we're treating what we're doing because we're with God. Rule number eight, trust God to deliver us in his own unique way. This is an interesting concept because when you look at the Bible, all you see are people who are in trouble, as I mentioned, but they were all fixed in so many different ways. They were fed by ravens. They were fed by everlasting food. The children of Israel were saved by opening up the sea. Jesus healed people with mud. Some people got healed by touching his cloak. And Jesus healed other people in long distances. Everything was so unique. It was so weird because it's not like God has this standard operating system. He doesn't just do the same thing over and over again. He is unique in how he helps people. And I don't know why it is. Like, why did he heal the blind man with mud? I'm not sure, but it was a way that God did it. And when you're looking at God leading you out of whatever trial you're in, look for that unique way that God can do it. And he said in the end, remember that God's ways are mysterious. They're strange to us. We don't understand why they happen. He watches out for us. He cares for us. And his supernatural being is a mystery to us. But then he was also human too. So we know he understands what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And sometimes it means that the answer is not really what we wanted to hear. John prayed to God and two days later was beheaded. How did God save John? The author says that God took John away so he couldn't be tortured by Herod anymore. And then the author offers up John 13, 7. Jesus answered him, what I am doing You do not understand now, but you will know after this that it's hard for us to understand what God is doing. The apostles thought that Jesus was on the peak of his ministry, not knowing that he would be dead only days after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He says, rule number nine is view your crisis as something to build your faith. It's going to make you stronger which doesn't feel all that comforting when you're very worried and stressed out, but you'll know it will build towards you. It will build your faith. It will build your trust. When I had job situations, I was in a job I really didn't love. And when I stepped out and left that job, I was not sure what I was going to do. It was a weird situation and too hard to explain, but I thought I was going to have money to live on for the next six months. And that I could think about what I was going to do. Through some weird turn of event, it turns out I didn't have that money to live on and I needed to find something right away. The great thing about it was two weeks later, I got hired for a job and it's the job I have now and the job that I love doing. God finds a way. And so now when I was stressed about my job being everything, it pays for this house, it pays for my bills. What am I going to do now? It was a way for me to trust God to make the situation better, even though that first week was rough and I was scared. But you know what? It came out okay. And I'm not saying that everything's going to come out like that. Again, it didn't work that same way for John. John's way out was by going to heaven and being with Jesus. That's not always going to be the way that you hope it to be, but know that God is always going to use it for good. He has your back, and it's always going to be a blessing to you so that we have to build our faith, we have to trust in God, and have to know that if there's a test in our life that we should be brought closer to God and not feel distant from God and not forget to pray to God. We need to draw closer. He said that Jesus taught the disciples on the mountainside 
and then loaded them into a boat and sent them into a storm. So it's not always what you think you may want to see happen, but sometimes it's something that's meant to do a different lesson. And he says, lastly, rule number 10, don't forget to praise him. Give thanks to God. He said that Moses and the Israelites all sang songs of praise to God when it got over with, that they sang in unity, that they were thankful to God. And I think sometimes we forget about that. Remember when God healed the 10 lepers and only one of them came back to thank God? Sometimes we remember, woohoo, this is over with. I realized that when I got my job and it was relief, it was over with, I was going to start this job and it looked really promising, I made sure to thank God. But sometimes it's not always that easy because you're just so happy something is over that you forget. So my challenge to you is see if there's a way that you can take a small step away from whatever problem it was last week that is giving you pause, causing you to worry or to stress out. What is the next best step that you can take to start walking through the water and get away from whatever is chasing you down? All right, everyone, thanks so much. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I will pray for you. I'll answer any questions you might have, or if you just tell me what you think about the podcast, I'd appreciate any feedback you may have. And remember, our way out of the Red Sea is by taking small steps. Small steps.